uh, for that uh, very interesting presentation. Um, this panel is all about kind of exploring alternative methods to traditional art galleries, and I think yours is kind of a quintessential example of that, um, not even having a permanent gallery space, but still continuing to work with artists in um, a multitude of different ways and finding new revenues to support them. I think it's uh, extremely valuable as we kind of, like you said, enter this kind of era of uncertainty um, and, uh, and, and of change. And, um, so let me introduce our two other speakers. Um, I have with me here uh, Yuko Yamamoto. Um, Yuko graduated from the master's program in international communications uh, at the Graduate School of International Politics, Economics, and Communication at the Aoyama Gaokuin University. <laughs> She's the, her, uh, she had the principal aim of making a new art foundation, uh, and eventually she integrated a gallery called Yamamoto Gendai um, into uh, a one unit with two other galleries um, where they presented an alternative vision of what an art gallery could be. Um, to her right, your left, I think, um, is Alexander Lau, um, the director at large at Empty Gallery. He is a curator, writer, and former filmmaker based in New York. Um, he is currently director at large at Empty Gallery and its associated record label, Empty Editions. Lau is also a board member of Blank Forms, a New York based nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion and preservation of time based art practices and primary information, a nonprofit art publisher. He has organized or participated in events in partnerships with organizations like Tycoon Contemporary, Videotage, Triple Canopy, Printed Matter, and uh, Taipei Fine Arts Museum. Um, so on that note, um, I'd like to ask uh, Alex and Yuko to explain what is, let's say, quote unquote, alternative about about your 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 galleries. Okay, um, I'll go first. I guess there are a lot of different aspects I could go into, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with our space, um, Empty Gallery is in Aberdeen. It's in Tinwan, and it's a two story gallery space in an industrial building. And the main the main thing that would strike people right off the bat as being as alternative about our space is that it's actually a black cube instead of a white cube model. And that came from our founder, Stephen Chang's concept, as well as, um, I guess as well as my own at that point, of being interested in intermedia art and coming out of a background in photography, experimental cinema, and performance, experimental music. So we really wanted to create a space that would focus on the experience of the work. And we feel that this dark space actually provides like a very high level of audience engagement. And something that's been quite striking about that is if we're talking about video work, for example, Often in a white cube setting, there are many, there are a lot of technical restrictions to installing videos. And one of the results is that, if we're going to be honest, I don't think that most people finish watching them. Whereas when we do a show, we've come to see people staying in the gallery space for 45 minutes, sometimes hours, and have actually yeah, sold video to people that have never collected it before, for example. So there's more I can say, but let's let you go introduce. Well, uh, well, let me introduce my interpreter, uh, Tokiko-san here, because my English is not that brilliant. So uh, I need some help. And uh, well, uh, the title of this uh, session is uh, Outside of the Cube, right? And well, actually, I'm stay in I stay in the white I mean cube not white uh, concrete but uh, in the, in the cube so uh, I'm not that alternative uh, if you know compared with others but uh, probably the style of learning gallery is alternative because uh, I used to learn my own gallery for 15 years by myself and uh, then last year, I united uh, with other two galleries in Japan, which I respect. Uh, and then we have some sort of uh, democracy inside of the gallery 
to have shows and activities and support artists, whatever. So uh, we always, you know, every day discuss with other directors and uh, maintain the diploma. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess, uh, uh, Yuko, I'd like to ask uh, you a question um, because this this kind of um, democratic model of running a gallery with 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 three kind of owners per se is. Um, from from my perspective, unusual. Um, I would say the traditional gallery model revolves around kind of a monolith figure, right? A dealer, and and this dealer is everything about the gallery, right? They're how it. They're they're, they're the program. They're the they're the money making source. They're the vision. And when once once they're gone, they've, that that's it, right? Um, what what inspired you to join up with 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 your two other partners and and kind of come together under one roof? Um, first of all. Um uh, the artist collective, uh, Chimpom, uh, uh, they are artist collective and they that they do some, um, you know, eto tabu ni fureri yona. They they do kind of they they do kind of um, touching the tabu matters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to deal with the, the well, I speak little English, so, but, um, well, uh, so they came up to me and uh, started to, to talk about their difficulties to be an artist in Japan, um, how to maintain their career and how to survive um, with their art activities. And uh, also, they said that um, there is no international gallery in Japan. This is quite. Uh, this was quite flesh uh, uh, criticism, crit criticism to me, because there are lots of um, um, big gallery uh, working internationally, but they defined them not international. So. Uh, I started to then I started to think about what is international, and uh, well, um, and the, the the circumstances of Japan, and then probably we are too small and too weak and always uh, are chased by um, you know dealing with collectors and museums and artists, so and I. Uh, so that uh, we need some more time to to think about it. Uh, everybody is so busy, right? <laughs> so, uh, she wants to help the um, artists, which can because the, in Japan there's many restrictions about um, what what they want to perform, but there is a many restriction cannot um, cannot they they cannot perform well. And also, she was surprised that one of the artists mentioned, some of the artists mentioned there is no international gallery in Japan, um, which she supposed it exists, but they, their comment is like this. So um, she think about what, what is the problem for this. And so she thinks that um, Japan gallery is taking more time and mind to earning running the business itself um galleries also needs the time to think about strategy and how to help the um, artists those so that's why um i come up with this kind of idea yeah yeah thank you yeah <laughs> um uh, uh i guess um this is for all three of you. I'd like to hear, it, and we can kind of just let it go from there. Um, what are some of the restrictions of your model, um, and what are some of the benefits that it allows you uh, that a more traditional gallery can't match? Right. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Um, well, I think for me, the the main hurdle right now is explaining what I do, and um, you know, it's not a concept that the art world is familiar with or comfortable with, um, although I, I think there are lots of entrepreneurial people doing similar kinds of work. 
um, I really am, you know, repping some of these artists in a way that traditional galleries are, but I'm also not doing, you know, monthly shows. I'm not, I don't have openings. Um, so I, I have to be very nimble, and um, that is actually, a, you know, it's a challenge, but it's actually an incredibly fulfilling um, thing to be able to overcome because then you become partners with venues or organizations, um, and you find opportunities that really extend beyond the art world, which was always my my mission. Um, I think for us, the one of the hurdles that we face is that. I mean, because we are this black cube space, I mean, that is quite in, let's just say like a, a bold or like strong gesture. So that does color everything we do in the space. Um, there are certain, I would say like genres of artistic practice that really driven, that are really driven by the aesthetic tension between the white cube environment and whatever object the artist is producing and they really need that tension in order to fully function, in order to deliver their meaning. Um, I would think of a lot of a lot of work that's derived from in institutional critique and a decent amount of conceptual art in that category. And I think that some of those objects just simply would not work in our space. So there's a restriction on which artists we can show in a certain sense, which works will function. Um, in our space. And I think on a practical business perspective, there also is a kind of um, a trade-off for having such a kind of immersive, engaging environment. We do have lots of people that spend a lot of time in the gallery, but at the same time, we don't have a front desk. And so, and it, because it's not a white cube as well, it really kind of tends to de-emphasize the works, even if they're objects, it de-emphasizes their nature is commodities so often people will walk through and unless you really know who to talk to in order to buy something you're not even going to be able to inquire about it so our model does have a certain i would say a certain barrier to um, people even knowing that the work is for sale sometimes people have come in and thought that we're an independent nonprofit before yeah, I, I know I've, I've personally had both experiences happen to me at Empty Gallery. Once where I was like, is it even open? I don't know how to get in. And then also literally spending an hour watching a video work in the in the gallery space, uh, both of which were fascinating and really exciting. Um, but so, uh, uh, Yuko, do you, do you have any, any, any comments about this? Um, any restrictions of your models or, or any benefits? Uh, yes, uh, well, it's probably um, um, not uh, <laughs> it, uh, well, uh, in Japan, there is uh, always peer pleasure to be, you know, to being same as others, and. Uh, recently uh, uh, the government or, or people pleasure is getting very very strong and uh, for example do you know H Triennale case and some uh, exhibition has had cancelled because of uh, they are showing Korean um, comfort woman work and uh, sort of uh, light-wing peoples against uh, that work and uh, in only um, two three days they closed the door, and this is uh, because uh, well they said it um, it use it 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 is used uh, for tax money I mean public funds so the um, exhibition has to be you know not um, criticized Japan itself. So, uh, and uh, this is the specific case in Japan, but uh, we are, you know, getting very much under pressure now. And uh, the museums, um, not only museums, even the artists started to do some sort of um, self-control and uh, voluntary control by themselves. And uh, 
it's it's really limited of uh, freedom expression now. So, uh, but Gallery, I mean, we have huge space, not the white, but a uh, huge space, and probably we can, you know, um, serve the space to the artist, whatever you know they want to do. And uh, this model is, uh, you know, uh, we sell the art, but we don't sell, you know, we on we don't only sell, you know, art. So we always learning with the artist. So um, um, well, we are independent and we earn money by ourselves and we spend. So this is the the, the very good. Uh, I mean, it's it's basic stuff. But uh, in Japan, this is um, the secured place to do something with artist now. So given this kind of like self censorship climate um, where what you show you're being very very conscientious of and, and maybe making decisions not to show certain things in a model like yours where you have two partners um, if an artist did want to show let's say this this pe this piece about Korean comfort women say you say you were to do an exhibition of this artwork um, is that how would you in your gallery navigate that situation would one of you just make the decision and it's okay or or do all three of you need to come to a consensus or or if one of them disagrees you don't do it uh, oh. mm -hmm. we we always discuss and uh, uh, that was happened uh, in the grand opening exhibition actually we had a chimpom do you know chimpom well uh, the artist collective and they wanted to it's not a you know kind of censorship something but they wanted to to put some uh, controversial artwork inside of the gallery which uses fire <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but i was in charge of them and uh, well of course i you know wanted to expand the possibility for them but other two uh, uh, owners of course, worry about it. But uh, three days discussion, after three days, uh, they made up their mind to show with me, with artists together. So uh, it's controversial, but. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing <laughs> that. Yeah, um, I, th I think that's really interesting. Um, we can talk more. Let, 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 let's let's talk about that aspect of it a little bit more because I think something that's interesting about all three of your kind of alternative programs is also the fact that none of them are named after yourselves, right? Um, there is no figure, it's, it's praise of shadows, empty, anomaly, right? Um, is there, in your vision, is there this underlying hope of, of a legacy, of, of creating something that can last beyond you or, um, or of, of, of thinking of the future, developing in, in ways you might not expect? Um, are, are these things you've thought about already, kind of being alternative from the, from the get-go? Um, anyone want to speak to that? I mean, that's actually a really interesting question. Um, and I almost wrote a New York Times essay about this. <laughs> my friend at the Times wanted me to do it, and I was just too busy launching my company, so I didn't. But you know, honestly, for me, um, being uh, you know Asian American, I'm, I'm I was born in Taiwan, and I my family came to America without expecting to stay. So I have a very Asian name, and in the United States, if I had to, you know, the Chen Gallery, I mean. That's like calling it the Smith Gallery, you know. I mean, that's like <laughs> millions of billions of people. Um, and then with my name, it just didn't seem uh, that it identified with what I was looking to do. And you know, the essay in Praise of Shadows is always really kind of formative and instrumental in how I, you know, studied art history and um, I and I worked with artists in in a way that always looked at the alternative and looked at the other perspective, which was what that essay spoke to me as. Um, and so there was never a question really of naming it, like whether I should name it after myself because it was about more than myself. It was about you know the artists who were already asking me for help that I was already helping to support. Um, and in terms of the legacy, I mean, you know, I think there are plenty of galleries uh, now in New York that are so powerful that are still named after, you know, the the founders. Uh, it, it, I don't think it's a really big deal that, um, you know, if their if their successor was not 
of that same name, it, it wouldn't, I don't think it would be a big problem. But, um, you know, so for me, honestly, it, it was naming my company because as an Asian person in the United States, that was a hard thing for me to overcome. Yeah. Um, for us, I think that there is a certain way in which, I mean, the tradition of, or the convention of naming your gallery after the proprietors, I mean, it's kind of an old, genteel tradition, and I don't think it necessarily fits with the times that we live in. But as well as that, I think that Stephen wanted to name the gallery empty on a, to kind of convey some philosophical ideas about creating a space where people can openly engage with art first and foremost as a kind of experience rather than as a business transaction. And in terms of legacy, I think that the name also implies a certain, maybe like non, not in a formal sense, but a certain kind of collectivism um, on the part of our staff, actually. I mean, we have a very unique, I think, staff structure compared to other galleries, which is relatively non-hierarchical. And we don't, even, we don't even have anyone who actually has the title gallery assistant at our title, uh, at our at our space, which is quite interesting. And there are three full-time staff, not including me and Stevens, that makes five of us. And there's a certain collectivity to it that I think going with a name which is not the founders kind of bolsters. I think I, I told, no? So, um, okay, uh, let's, <laughs> uh, let's move on. Um, uh, in, 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 yeah, in terms of uh, the larger ecosystem that we're all living in, um, what is your relationship like to, um, and, and you, you mentioned that you still work with museums in a traditional way, you work with collectors in a much less traditional way. Um, uh, empty gallery, being a black cube. Um, in my mind, for some reason, that means art fairs shouldn't make sense to me, right? Are all of your art fair booths black? Are you, are you paying to have them painted every time? Um, or what does that mean for your relationship to art fairs um, and, and things like that? Do you want to speak about how, how your relationships to any one of these factors may change, collectors, museums, art fairs, et cetera? Sure, um, I'll answer that and then, yeah, and then you can go. Um, I think that for us, definitely the, the art fair question, you know, was something that was, let's say, there was a lot of debate about it when we decided to do our first fair because exactly how do you take a space that is somewhat premised on being um, not only a black cube but in itself like somewhat immersive and providing ideal conditions for, for viewing particularly time-based art, how do you like transport that into a fair setting in a convention center, which is on all counts, you know, almost exactly the opposite of that. And I think that we, in the end, we did, we did actually do a black booth once um, at the Armory show. And after that, we, yeah, you saw, we were, we were in the same section together actually. But after that, we felt that it was too much of a, idiosyncratic gesture that in a sense just sticking out that much in a fair setting or having the booth architecture itself stand out that much was kind of a negative or that it 
again, interfered with people, you know, just looking at the art itself. So we decided to kind of swallow it and just go with normal fair presentations. And now we participate in, in our Basel Hong Kong. Um, we've done Freeze New York before. We'll be doing Felix in Los Angeles next year. And I think that we have come to a place where we're confident enough in the identity of the gallery and the gallery's program that we think that the work we show will communicate those values and be kind of suffused by those values, even if we do it in, in a different setting. I will say to, to go back to the potential pitfalls of, of our model, um, actually doing fairs has become very useful and very essential for us because of the like because of the difficulty of the work that we sell and the kind of non commerce oriented architecture of the physical space. I mean, because a fair is obviously transparently all about commerce. So for us that's been something that's very much like outside of our practice of what we do in the gallery space itself, but a very necessary complement to it. I think I think that's fascinating because I'm the first one to complain about art fairs. And so the fact that you're doing something so ag against the trend, but utilizing this, this other kind of aspect of our, our, our world, of our art world is, I think, I think really fascinating. Yeah. Um, do you want to say anything? Maybe about your relationship to, to, to um, museums, collectors, art fairs? Well, uh, all three directors of us um, um, had uh, experience of more than 10, 15 years, you know, own, owning Gilly. And uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, um, so many contacts in a different levels. And uh, so we combine and uh, then, um, you know, new people, I mean, no, the, the one director has one uh, uh, f uh, friend of curators and we see each other and we introduce each other and we share all the, the collectors and uh, museum directors you know forever so uh it's like three times more than we had before and then the uh, the people i mean came up to us um share the three times more information of the artist so uh it's good and uh well, uh, in terms of the fair, at fair, uh, to be honest, uh, we're tired of it. <laughs> and, uh, it's okay, different situation. <laughs> yes, well, but uh, the art fair is a good, very good meeting point still now, and uh, but too many art fairs, so uh, we try to moderate to to you know, participate participating uh, at fair now. Um, Ying, uh, w w what's your relationship to, to art fairs? I mean, have you ever participated in one? Do they uh, do they allow a gallery, quote unquote, without um, a space to do that? I'm, for my, for Prey Shadows Fine Art, I mean, it just launched 10 days ago, maybe not even. So I'm not looking at it in that way. Um, but for snark.art, the blockchain company that I talked about, um, we became, uh, I was the chief marketing officer and we became a sponsor of the NADA Art Fair in Miami last, last December. Um, so, you know, they were very interested in having um, our platform on site to, you know, bring in um, this new form of technology and, you know, Eve Sussman's work. Uh, so I was there in Miami for days and talking ad nauseum and it would honestly take me about 45 minutes per person to first to explain blockchain, second to explain this project um, and even though you know these works of art are you know they're digital they're not expensive it is just such a different concept um, and you know we were able to connect with a lot of new people and uh, you know former collectors of Eve's um, but it was it was a big challenge because also when you're in a situation like Miami you know no one has an attention span of more than five minutes so um, you know, it's not something, I mean, you know, this next week I'll be in Miami again for that digital art fair, but I'm not gonna be sitting in a booth. <laughs> I, you know, luckily for this, um, this digital art festival or this art fair, they are projecting these works. If anyone needs me, they can call me, but you know, I'm much more interested in relationship building for the artists that I work with. I think that is essential to 
what I'm doing. Um, I'm not working with, you know, blue chip artists. They are artists that I believe in, that I'm investing in their futures and their careers. So, you know, I was thinking about this the other day because when I started out in the art world, I was in a museum. And then I went to an auction house. And you know, this is more than 10 years ago where if you did that, you were told, oh, you'll never be able to go back to a museum. You'll never go back to a nonprofit. You're tainted now. You know? And now the whole art structure is different. I mean, you really can. Like Lisa Dennison went from the Guggenheim to Sotheby's right after I did. And you know, that was a huge bit of news in the New York art world. I don't know how that behavior is looked upon in Hong Kong, but in New York, there was so much uh, rigidity in terms of who you were in the art world and what you were allowed to do. Um, because now I've worked in you know, the commercial side and the nonprofit side, I don't really don't see it as either or. I just see it as you know, my, my work is on behalf of the artist. Um, and it's almost like as if I was still in-house at the Asian Society or at PS1, because my work is in promoting the artist. And you know, regardless of whether uh, it's a show that is in a public space, in a private space, in a commercial space, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's what the artist wants to achieve. Do um, any of you think that these kind of alternative models will become the norm? in the future. Um, do you see these as, as kind of uh, being so successful you think that's where ultimately we will all head or, or do you see them as always kind of uh, uh, existing on, on, on the fringes of, of our system? Um, did every, I mean, okay, if you're in the US and you may have seen Roberta Smith from the New York Times, she posted something a couple weeks ago about the mega galleries and you know their humongous roster of artists. Um, and there was, you know, the discussion on the comment section was just, oh my God, no one can survive, no one can make it in the art world as an artist anymore. Um, you know, only the 1% of the galleries are interested in this small group of artists. I don't think that, you know, these galleries are going to go away, and I don't think that they should. But I, I also believe that um, there is now this need for more flexibility in how artists are being presented. And um, you know, at the end of the day, the artists need to pay their rent. They have to take care of their families. And who can, you know, who can criticize them for taking on alternative projects or working with alternative spaces? And also, a lot of artists that I work with, you know, they have gallery representation, to be honest. I am not interested in doing that for them. What I'm doing is creating projects outside of that because, you know, <laughs> like w when you meet an artist and they're not wrapped by a gallery, all they want is to be wrapped by a gallery. And then when they're wrapped by a gallery, you, you hear, like, th you know, there's just complaints ongoing, right? And so there's always something to be done. Like there's always work to be done. So I don't think that it's gonna stay static in this way, but I do think that um, you know, the models are going to change and people just have to be more entrepreneurial to make it. Your question is if there are aspects of, like, of our kind of alternative model that can be, let's say like poured in. Yeah, yeah, and, and expanded upon and, and even made the norm, you know? Right, I think that Maybe the specific identity of empty, I mean, is cannot really be completely imitated, but I do think in terms of approaching the building of a gallery as um, something more than just a kind of showroom in terms of thinking about thinking about a holistic brand, thinking about building a community, having a lot of performances, which is something we tend to we do. I think that like thinking about the gallery brand in this more holistic way is something that appeals to a lot of young people right now. And I think that that is something that could be imitated as well as kind of bringing back an old idea of thinking about a gallery program over time or the roster of artists you work with as almost being a form of long-term curation. I mean, particularly in a time of market expansion, I mean, there are enough dealers who are just following trends who in the end have like an incoherent program. And I think what is particularly necessary right now in East Asia and elsewhere, which could be imitated, is to approach a gallery program as a long-term curatorial project and not just as 
going with what works in the moment commercially. Fascinating. Uh, Yuko, do you, do you want to say anything? Yes. Regarding the, um, eventually this kind of alternative model to become norm, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, she thinks yes, and still, <laughs> um, there is a possibility to become like standard. Um, space is consist of the period of demand, which is like um, um, trend. So it is important to catch that demand. Um, nowadays, is kind of um, gallery is kind of low in, in exhausted. So uh, for us to overcome this part, um, we need to lead the work more cheerful and happy and respected. We don't want to put the art art into the poor position. Yeah, to, to survive in this world. So nanka. Yes, the, the space always stands to d by the demands of the time, but uh, the art uh, is not always, um, um, I don't know, uh, well, uh, the good art is not really understandable at that, I mean, in the same era. So probably we do some strange things uh, and throw the balls uh, away as far as possible. And uh, it returns to us uh, uh, some decades later. So um, um, what the question? The future aspects, yes. So, uh, so uh, I, I, I mean, we're trying to do that, the, the, uh, some unpredictable uh, uh, things uh, always welcome, and uh, we try to um, do um, something very uncanny thing. Sorry, can I? One of the galleries that I work with um, on a marketing advisory level is a gallery in Boston called the Kingston Gallery, and they've been around for about 30 years. Um, and you know, your question is is important, but also you have to think like there, these models have already existed. It's just that you know they may not have made the most money, they may not have gotten the most press, but they have been around. So Kingston's been around for about 30 years, but it's an artist-run gallery. Um, there are 28 members. They all have to do a ton of work, but they all get a show about once a year, or no, I guess once every couple of years. Um, and it's been really interesting because, you know, in Boston, where the landscape is primarily academic, a lot of them are teachers at Harvard, at Tufts, at the MFA school. Um, that's how they make their. That's how they make a living. But in order to really you know, come out with their artworks, they have these goals that are part of the gallery. So um, you know, it's not even a new model. Like Jerry Saltz started out in, in an artist-run gallery, right? I mean, this is how you take initiative when nobody else wants to show you. But these are also models that can be sustained for a long time. Um, but you just have to stay committed to it. Yeah, and per perhaps we'll see more and more of these as, as, as we progress in the future. Um, but for now, um, as we're kind of uh, rapidly running out of time, um, I want to uh, open the floor to any questions that, that people may have. Um, maybe not so much of a question, but some sort of reflection. Uh, maybe a question will come during the reflections. Um, I enjoyed um, all the, uh, you know, hearing from the three of you. And I think Ian was very interesting to hear what you're doing because in a way it's finding uh, not necessarily um, a model, um, something conflict with the gallery, but something that supplement the gallery work and create a, a, a supplement of uh, form of income for artists. Uh, and this is something that I'm sure we all experience. If you run a, a medium, small gallery, 
um, you, you support your artists as much as you can, but sometimes sales are slow, the business is slow, the market is slow, whatever. People want to just buy the brands, and, and so artists have to live. Artists have to pay bills, and so I think this can be a very interesting way to supplement their work, uh, their income without demeaning the, the, the role of the gallery or without taking that away. Um, and I think that's very, uh, a very, a very interesting uh, model that I'm sure can be replicated in different parts of the world. Um, and I see that will happen. I'm not 100% sure, and I know you're not involved in that, uh, but in the buying shares of artwork to uh, blockchain, I think that really demeaning, the, makes art just a, as another commodity. And, and uh, yes, you might inspire somebody to become a collector uh, at a certain point, but the reality is that um, uh, it really, it doesn't work for me. <laughs> Uh, I'm doesn't work slightly old-fashioned. I think you have to go and, in, you know, you have to own your own work. You don't, you know. I, I, but I do like the idea of, of the digital, be, using that te uh, technology for the uh, new media. That makes complete sense, of course. Um, I'm a great fan of the Empty Gallery. If you haven't been, you must go. It's one of the best galleries in Hong Kong, so please go. Um, and I like the model that you have, and I think it's really... Um, uh, also, I think it captures something that is, goes beyond the art world, that is the way that people want to experience things in a more holistic way, not just in the art world, in general, and having an experience that is more immersive. Uh, you can see that in different um, industry, in a way, uh, and it's interesting to apply that to the art, art industry. And I've, again, I can see your type of model, um, you know, with a different maybe philosophy, but being replicated because uh, I think uh, we have to find different ways to engage to an audience that, uh, that is also uh, younger audience, they might have different uh, stimulus, different way of looking at things. And so you have to find a way to, to really engage with them. And, and your model, I think, is very successful uh, because of that. Um, and you, you could, they, 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 what you do again is, is I think, is something that that uh, will be replicated, it has to be replicated partially because uh, it's, it's the only defense mechanism that smaller gallery can have these days. You know, it's really about sharing uh, resources and whether you share them in one location, in Tokyo, three galleries, or whether you share them across different region, different uh, countries. Um, it's really something that we, we as medium small gallery really have to think about how to to survive uh, the juggernaut of the mega galleries and the auction houses, we know that. And and not to say that they have a role to play; it's their universe, and we don't have to to touch that. But we have to survive, and we have to support our artists. So, um, this is a general comment. I don't know if there was a question there. Probably not. <laughs> uh, but let me see. I think, I think, um, I think I give it back to the room. Does anybody want to want to comment on, on on any of that at all? No. I mean, I agree. That sh going to your comment about blockchain and the shares, um, that is not how I collect either. And I I really appreciate having a relationship with the artists, but um, I think it's interesting because you know you think about the the people using um, technology as a way of entertainment now, right? That is predominantly how people are getting ent entertainment. Um, and I think the art world would be very foolish to not look at that as a way of um, creating new audiences. Um, you know, and it doesn't have to be expensive, right? Like you could have works on a phone, um, an original that you can enjoy. And, um, you know, it, it may not show on your wall, but it's something that as a collector, you would still have access to. So I think there are different ways to do it. The interesting thing about fractionalized ownership is that like that Kahinda Wiley you saw, you cannot collect that in, uh, in Hong Kong because it's all regulated as a security. I mean, there are lots of questions now about blockchain um, assets and what kinds of art or what kind of assets they are. So there were a lot of regulation questions. Um, you know, I think that feature is still to be determined. Uh, any other questions or comments? Really in the back? I think we have. Uh, 
Um, thank you. Um, one of you mentioned entrepreneurship in the art world, and since, since we're talking about uh, alternative business models, um, but if we talk about entrepreneurial and startups, uh, in a business world, um, it's easy to attract investors because it's, for example, in the tech world, uh, the business are usually scalable and you can generate a lot of uh, income, cash, very quickly. But startups in the art world or any disruptive business models in the art world, uh, that's, it's, not usually, it's usually not scalable and it's not profitable. Um, so just in terms of attracting financial backers to support uh, new ideas and startups in the art world. Um, do you have? Do you see any success stories in New York, or do you have any good ideas that can help young people or upcoming people who want to start new business models in the art market? Thank you. So, yeah. um, so during my time with Snark.Art, you know, there there was an angel investor that helped the company start, um, and then uh, cryptocurrency took a huge dive in 2018, and that was really difficult for them. Um, so I think it's really hard to get investors in the art world. Period. I mean, art is not a main contemporary art is not a mainstream audience pleaser. <laughs> it's just not. I mean, you know, with the exception of certain artists that are huge, this is when you see brands collaborating with artists like Takashi Murakami and Louis Vuitton, you know, and Uniqlo with Basquiat and Herring. Um, but that's a whole different level. I think, um, you know, when I was at that company, Tatley, she, the founder was approached very often by investors and she always turned them down. Uh, and that was a lesson I learned, you know, was that it might have helped every once in a while to have a little bit more capital, but at the end of the day, we were completely independent. We did not have to um, answer to any investors. I think you're, you know, you're seeing that even with Sotheby's now going private. You know, when I was there, every quarter, something would happen. Either half the staff would be laid off, or you would add more people, or you got a big bonus. You know, I mean, it was just super volatile. Um, so I think with investors and entrepreneurship in the arts. It's a very tricky question, and for me personally, I would rather try and do this on my own, maybe with some, um, you know, backers that I know very well. But I would not open this up to uh, to VCs at all. I think from a from a different perspective on that, I mean, in terms of a gallery kind of having the endurance to build its program over time a small to medium sized gallery in the current climate. I think that, while I, I don't know if I would say that from a business perspective, this would be the soundest investment, but I think if you look at galleries that are often showing the most challenging art, um, that might be the most kind of, I don't know if I want to use the word academic, but that might be the most respected by institutional curators. Um, if you look at those spaces in America and Europe, a lot of them have um, silent partners who are basically invested and willing to support the gallery long term, not through the sale of, of art, but by providing a way to keep it running because they believe in the discursive mission of the space. And I also think that that is related to something we're seeing a lot more now, which is collectors running, like this kind of blurring between gallerists and collectors, collectors running galleries, things like that. And I think that in a certain way that can be positive because you're talking about people that are very enthusiastic about about work. Well, I've never been uh, in person and uh, also uh, I really don't need to be in person because uh, we, have, uh, we are three owners and uh, we maintain each other uh, time to time. And uh, this is one of the, the big reasons to be united. Because, uh, for example, I take less, someone works. <laughs> and, uh, and also, uh, we really don't want to be a big gallery or, or super rich. Uh, and, uh, well, and we can't be, to be honest. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to. So we we just you know we wanted to maintain you know the artists activities and our activities ourselves, 
and uh, well and uh, the important thing is investigation makes us limited so uh, yeah never yeah. have experience for difficulty for their question I think I think it was I think it was a good question and an interesting question and and in an odd way a question that um, all three of you have avoided in terms of the business right in terms of trying to, to establish yourself independently I think that's that's a, a, in pursuing an alternative model that's kind of like a, a core um, in, in my understanding of it is that you have to maintain your own vision and kind of be able to move and and do what you do without without any any other kind of restrictions um, yeah. Uh, any any other uh, comments or questions? No? Oh, yeah, got one. Hi, um, thanks for all your uh, insights into your uh, respective galleries. Um, I wanted to actually ask you ab about um, the way that you interact with your clients and potential customers and whether you find there's a big generational divide in the way that people relate to art uh, because you're kind of emerging or let's say younger galleries with an alternative model but I'm wondering if across the collector base whether say baby boomers versus Millennials like have a different idea of what they want from a gallery and you know kind of the relationship that you might change your program or the way you would change your program to suit this new say collector base Um, when I did the exhibition on Park Avenue, it was on 77th and Park Avenue, which if, you know, any of you have been to New York, that's the Upper East Side. That's a very traditional kind of, uh, it's a demographic that's different from Brooklyn. And um, we, I showed a video work that was incredible, very challenging. Um, and there was actually, you know, a, a collector in his 70s who came in and uh, kept coming back. And you know what? He lived next door. And I wouldn't have met him if, you know, I mean, because honestly, most of the collectors for the works in that show were um, were people that were approximately my age. Um, and so, you know, but here was someone who was interested in the most challenging work, um, a digital work, and he was, you know, he was the the elder statesman of, of the collector group. So, um, but yeah, I mean, so much of that is dependent for me on location and on, you know, on where I happen to pop up. So, you know, um, when I do the next show, which might be, you know, in, I, I have a, several plans, but one is in like a very, renew, like a part of the United States that is undergoing an urban renewal. Um, I think that will have a different collector base as well. Um, but in terms of, you know, me just getting people to buy things, those are people that are in my circuit. And, um, and you know, now with the artsy experiment, we'll see how that's going. But I, I imagine so far what I've seen from my analytics is that most of the people are similar to me. They just are. Um, and I don't know if it's because of the, the artists that I'm showing, which are also approximately my age, but um, I'm not seeing a huge like generational divide so far. I suppose um, I think it depends on what like what region we're talking about. But I think if we're talking about Hong Kong and East Asia, I mean, our gallery program is quite, and the events we do as well, I think, are quite like geared towards a younger generation of people. And I do find there to be quite a difference in taste between um, older and younger collectors. And I think that we could speculate uh, historically on on why that is maybe more the case um, in Hong Kong and other East Asian countries. And it might be because certain types of work here, like maybe minimalism and conceptualism was never, and video art as well, were not widely exhibited until much later. So I find that maybe for collectors interested in that, I will find older collectors in America or Europe, but not necessarily here. Here it's people who are in their 30s or 40s, but not older clients. Um, for example, um, there's a lot of speculation we could do on this, but I guess it's just that's just an observation. Well, uh, so many kinds of collectors we have uh, because of you know we united, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> well, uh, uh, probably uh, Japanese art market is quite quite small. But uh, one advantage we have is, you know, so many people come to sightseeing and uh, uh, 
all those uh, international big collectors uh, frequently come to Tokyo. Tokyo is such a characteristic city and uh, good food. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and uh, after we got to be anomaly, um, we had um, not every day, but every week, we have guests from you know all over the world to see art because um, we are strange and we are we have big space and uh, uh, walls shows, so uh, they can't probably ignore and they visit us and uh, we have good connections with all those people and uh, yeah it works in japan thank you um i think uh that will conclude our uh panel um we have a, another full day of events tomorrow uh starting at 10 30 ish yeah yeah first session is at 10 30 great um i hope to see everyone tomorrow and uh, I want to give a special thanks to all of our panelists. Um, thanks, guys.